Well, hello! It's time for another exciting episode of Pens in Use. This is the show where I talk about the fountain pens and inks that I've been using throughout the week. And if you didn't notice, I arranged my pens because it's June, so <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, I've got something special for you at the end because we'll be taking a trip, a long trip, so we'll talk about that here in a bit. If videos like this interest you, where I talk about fountain pens, both new and old and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. And do you have any travel plans now that uh, vaccines are becoming more common and we can get out now? I don't know about you, but I sure do. So uh, I took one of those trips this week. So at the end of the video, we will talk about it. And I'll share, you, share words, share some highlights with you. <laughs> so let's take a look at the pens. All right, so from left to right, we have a Platinum President, Parker Dual Fold Centennial, Parker Dual Fold International, uh, a Buehler pen, a Mont Blanc Monte Rosa. I got corrected on that last week. Uh, a Selector, I'm just going to call it Model Purple and Black. A Caveco 101, V101, sorry. And, whoops, point you up here. We have a Pond Senior. So let's see how they write. As always, I'll be performing the writing sample in my cognitive surplus. My first pen is going to be this beautiful Platinum President with a cursive italic nib. Uh, the ink in it is a sample that I was sent by a, a viewer. Oops, get at a better angle here. Uh, this viewer sent me some samples of various Waterman inks, which you have seen so far. I can't remember if this is a broad or a coarse. Broad, okay. Um, he sent me the uh, Waterman inks you've seen, and I think you may have seen an Ackerman ink, or if you haven't, you will. Uh, so, anyway, several that I've just never used. So this one is Noodler's. Rabaul Red, which I may have mispronounced that. I don't know this for sure, but I want to say that's a World War II reference. Uh, be curious to see he mentioned something about color changes in this so I'll be curious to see if it does that and this pen will be a good illustration of why I do uh, some of the things I do with these swatches I do this just to show the color of the ink but then I do this it's kind of an oblique test which this is not an oblique nib so that's why it really makes no difference. And then I do this because it shows how stubby it is, or italic, I should say. Actually, I don't think I have an oblique out this week. My next pen is not the old Parker Dua Fold. That one uh, went on a trip with me. Uh, somewhere during that trip, it blooped. You know, that that's perhaps a limitation of being a sack filler because it was the only pen that blooped. Luckily, it was Parker Quink Washable Blue that blooped, so, you know, I washed it. So, uh, now I'm doing that, I've pulled out the nib and feed, and I'm doing the long overdue nib work. Nib work. So, sorry. So, this is a Parker Dual Fold. Do I mean Centennial? Suddenly I'm questioning that. Oh well. Okay, wow. Your spelling is great there, squirrel. Uh, this has a fine nib in it. This is a nice pen. Uh, the ink in it is Robert Oster. And considering the amount of these I drove through, I think it's appropriate. Yeah. You'll see a little bit of that in the little later in this video. 
We are still in a drought situation though, so I'd welcome a few more of those, but they kept my garden alive while I was gone. But I have to go out and put up the drip tape. I was going to do it yesterday, but the wind was blowing so bad, I just had visions of myself chasing drip tape all up and down the neighborhood, so uh, decided to wait till today. Well, fuzzy on my lip. Decided to wait until today to uh, do it because it's a lot less windy. Probably should have done it this morning. My neighbor was mowing, so I didn't want to film this. I was going to do it last night, but, you know, uh, things got in the way. This is uh, my Parker Dual Fold International. Very beautiful pen. This is one of the two pens that this channel bought me this year. So thank you for that. So this is a Parker Dual Fold. And this one's the international size. And mine has a medium nib on it. Which definitely looks broader than the fine. Although I think Parker's tend to run broad. The ink in this is De Atramentis. Mint Turquoise. And a question that came up, uh, maybe just for me, <laughs> is how, si T -U -R -Q -U -O -I -S -E, is how similar is this to uh, that... Uh, not planet Earth. The, the one that's named after the planet Earth. Uh, pale blue dot. So, I'm going to do my swatch here, and then I'm going to page back to where I last did pale blue dot, and we're going to find out. Pale blue dot is a color verse ink that's only found in a special series. It's one of the inks I have used up this spring. I guess I wrote Summer Storm here technically isn't summer yet, even though my air conditioner in the car had to work overtime and my here in the house is probably going to have to work overtime later today. So there we go, we have some Colorverse Pale Blue Dot. I got a smear, yeah. This is a very wet pen. <laughs> oh heck with it, let it smear. <clears throat> No, uh, they're they're in the same family, but th this um, mint turquoise is definitely more blue. So there we go. That didn't smear too bad. I made a nice impression over here, though. Too bad, Lee. Sorry, I didn't grammar good. My next pen I haven't had out in a while. This is a Boulder pen. And maybe it's an original, I am not sure, because it does say... Wow, this looks really dark. Builder original right there. Paper looks right, I don't know. I adjusted the exposure for the paper, maybe that was my mistake. And it comes with a Bach nib, because it's got a leaping goat thing. So this is a Builder. What in the heck is... Oh! Can't forget the umlaut. This is Diamine. Jade, another sample that he sent to me. I feel like I need to write more, but that's just a really short entry. I know next to nothing about Buehler. I had two of these. I gave uh, one of them away. So when you go to the review, it's going to show both of them. Uh... I don't even remember who I gave it to, but hopefully they're enjoying it. So, kind of a fun nib. You know, the, these vintage Bach nibs are fun. Let's not kid ourselves. Can help what's really a fairly pedestrian pen to be a lot more. Then we have 
Monteverde Turquoise, Monte Rosa Turquoise. Just getting down there. I was writing with, a lot with this while I was traveling. Why? Did I say Monteverde? I apologize. I meant Mont, Mont Blanc. Do I own a Monteverde pen even? I don't know. Oh, I do. Uh, I have a Regatta Sport. This has an extra fine nib, and the ink in it is Pelican. Last week I wrote the wrong name. I called it, what did I call it? Yeah, I called it Brilliant Blue last week. It's not, it's Royal Blue. Pelican 4001 Royal Blue. Apparently it's a washable ink, and uh, I am planning to sacrifice a t-shirt soon for a little experiment with that. So stay tuned for that. I've got a few weeks here where I'm at home, so I'm going to do some of these things. And then I'll be off to the east end of the state for a class. Uh, the reason I was traveling this week was I was at uh, Governor's Summit on Innovative Education in Bismarck, which we can do in person now that we're vaccinated. And uh, then I continued on through towns that I'd lived in before, mostly, and some others that I just liked. Um, this is my purple part of the flag I was trying to create. I think I forgot to mention that at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> This one behaved itself pretty well as far as, uh, you know, that whole blooping thing that the Parker did not, but, you know. So this is a selector. I'm just going to call it Model Purple and Black. Look, I don't really have a purely purple pen. The ink in it is diamine. Damson. Which is a very dark purple. I don't really remember anymore what made me buy that bottle, but I did buy it. Must have liked the color. The one I really like, except I think it might be a Girbon, is Poussier de Lune. Which I think I haven't used in a while. This desperate drive to use up bottles, I'm forgetting to use inks that I actually enjoy also. Like uh, Noodler's Black Swan and Australian Rose hasn't made an appearance in a long time. So... Maybe instead of focusing so much on using up ink, maybe I should just enjoy what I have. And When I use up a bottle, great. Except I do think I need to keep forcing myself to use these inks that I don't like because I want to get them used. <laughs> Alright, this is a Caveco V101. Whoops. I did something goofy with the light this time. It's called a V... Yeah, it's dark. It's called a V because that thing is sort of hood over the nib. Um, I didn't think through the inks as far as the flag thing, so, you know, don't look for the pattern there. This has an extra fine nib in it. And the ink is Petticon 4001 Violet. And really, these last two pens aren't in the official flag, I guess. I just uh, wanted eight pens, because I always feel like it's too short if I do less than eight. And I've been using them. So. This one especially. 
Uh, the next one I haven't used too much this week, but I, you know, I've used it, just not a lot. Did some let Woo! One of my lights just tried to fall off the desk. Uh, did some letter writing while I was in the motel at night. I don't really want... I didn't turn on the TV at all, come to think of it. I don't really do TV. If I watch something, it's going to be on uh, the computer. Something I choose to watch. And my last pen is my Pond Senior. The beautiful stacked celluloid. I saw Penultimate Dave had a picture of some Viscontis on his Instagram that with their beautiful stacked celluloid. Oh, it's condensation. Jeez, I'm looking at the nibbling. Is that mold? No. It's starting to evaporate now. Let's see if you can see it. Okay, so this is a Pond Senior. I don't know what the nib size is, but the ink in it is Ackermann. SBRE Brown. Who's famous enough to get an ink named after him, not quite famous enough to get a fountain pen test named after him. So this is another sample that that person, that viewer sent me. You know, like I said, they sent me some Ackermann, some Waterman, and uh, that Rebel Red that I opened with. And I can't remember, there was something else in there I saw. And again, this one... Oops, you missed most of that. This one has a little bit of stub character to it, which is fun. So those are the pens and inks I've been using this week, except there was a pocket pen, because mostly I was wearing t-shirts this week, uh, except when I was at the Governor's Summit. So I uh, I was carrying around a, po a vintage platinum pocket pen, so it's kind of like that uh, uh, Pilot E95S that I've been using that's finally out of ink. Um, so that was my pen, but, you know, since we're, I can't show it to you till I uh, have done a video on it, we're just going to have to wait. And I didn't get to the video this week, so a lot, lot was going on this week. So a uh, lot going on just in general, but yeah, I'm home, I'm going to work on my garden and uh, work on some pens, especially with the hot afternoons, I'll be in here in front of my air conditioner <laughs> working on pens. So, uh, but I did take a trip I, to Bismarck, so that's the furthest I've been from home since the pandemic started. First time I stayed in a motel since the pandemic started. Went to the summit on Monday, which was pretty good, it usually is, except maybe last year when it was virtual, I didn't enjoy it then. But then I decided to go hit some high spots. So I've driven you through Turtle Lake before, but I haven't driven you through any of the other towns I've lived in. So I did the grand tour of all of them, plus some extras that I like. And I was going to take you to the International Peace Gardens, but two things. Uh, one thing is you need a passport to get out. Getting in, no problem. Getting out, ooh. So you need a passport, and you need to have, um, if you don't have a passport, you need to have a driver's license, which I had, and a birth certificate, which, weirdly enough, I didn't bring with me. So, I, I did decide after that I'm going to start working next week on getting a passport. Who knows, it, it could come in handy and it'll give me a little freedom if someday I say, I just want to leave the country with what money, but yeah. Money that's going to be a new roof. But anyway, so I uh, didn't go there and as it turned out, it was absolutely pouring rain. Um, so, I probably wouldn't have enjoyed it much anyway. So, I'm just going to have to... Shucky darn, make another trip to go see it. Because I haven't seen that in a long time, and I, I want to. So anyway, um, the rest of this is why pens and use didn't happen last night, because it took me longer to put this together than I thought it would. So uh, enjoy. If you don't like... This is basically north-central North Dakota, so from Bismarck north. A little bit west, but not very west. And a lot east. 
uh, basically everything except for the final scene is filmed north of the interstate. So enjoy or not, and we'll talk to you later. So my little road trip started because I wanted to go visit the Governor's Summit on Innovative Education. Last year, thanks to COVID, it had been held virtually, which is awful. But this year it was in person. I've had my vaccine and I thought, doggone it. I haven't done anything since March of last year. So this is my first trip since the uh, whole pandemic started. Uh, some of the highlights of the Governor's Summit, which was held in Bismarck, North Dakota, were uh, behavioral health. Um, there is quite a lot to that and a lot about how we handle behavior in our schools that I thought was well worth listening to. Uh, there was a keynote speaker that talked about the growth mindset and you know how to use constructive criticism to build and improve our uh, students. And finally, uh, Hadi P Partovi was actually present and and apparently this was also his first time out of the out of his house thanks to the pandemic uh he, he's the founder of code.org and his whole vision is bringing computer science to regular people and you know full disclosure i do use his curriculum for my computer science class uh and then uh he did a q a with Governor Doug Burgum, which uh, I've got a photograph of that here. And if you're wondering, um, Governor Doug Burgum actually got his start by founding a tech company, which was later bought up by Microsoft. So he's a tech guy, uh, which is interesting. Um, so, you know, I, I stayed Sunday night in Bismarck because this started at, what, 8? And then uh, the next... I, I wanted to do this trip, so then I got an extra night in the motel. So I started out from my, in my car to head out on my big trip because I wanted to visit people in all the towns I'd taught in in North Dakota. And I had an ambitious two-day plan to do so. And my plan immediately <laughs> had an obstacle thrown up when the check engine light came on in the Camry. So... <laughs> I decided I'm going to drive to the Toyota dealer. And I remembered there was one on the east end of Bismarck. So, uh, of course, on the way, every single time I smelled like gasoline fumes or something that could be overheating, I was thinking, oh no, it's the Camry. And, uh, you know, I, I kept imagining that the Camry's running rough and all sorts of crazy stuff. But anyway, I took it to Cedric Thiel, and I am identifying them by name, even though I don't usually do that, because they were awesome. Even though I didn't have an appointment, they took me in. They even let me do an oil change, which was the one thing I'd planned to do to the car that, sm that morning. Um, it, it, they were just amazing. So, thank you, Cedric Thiel, Toyota. You are amazing, and I'm... Giving you a shout out to my 5,000 plus subscribers who, if they're ever in Bismarck, North Dakota and need Toyota things, I'm recommending you. I will say I was a little surprised by how bare their sales lot was, but I've read some news that apparently there's a, a microchip shortage that is causing a shortage of cars. So I guess that explains that. But anyway... A uh, very good experience there. And it turned out to be minor. It's actually a problem the car has had because it's 21 years old. I had a, it, it was rust on the gas cap is what they think. So they cleaned off the gas cap and uh, I haven't seen the check engine light since. Um, I then journeyed north on kind of a combination of Highway 83 and uh, whatever the other one was. I got off 83 at Wilton and I... Didn't write down the name of the road, but I think it's like 41. But anyway, I journeyed to Turtle Lake, North Dakota, which I have taken you through Turtle Lake before because I did a video where I talked about lessons learned in Turtle Lake. Um, you might guess that since I have the other towns that I taught in, in this road trip, that maybe I have future videos coming, and I do. Uh, but I didn't tour Turtle Lake too much. Um, 
Okay, I toured it a little, but mainly I was touring it because I couldn't figure out where my friend lived. She didn't live where, where she lived when I when I lived in Turtle Lake, so I, I kind of had to drive around a little to figure it out. And I got east and west confused from her direction, so that was fun. But and it, We had a really nice visit, and I hated to say goodbye, but I did have another friend to visit that day in a motel room already reserved, so... You know, even though I was already quite behind on my schedule, I was going to try to sort of keep with it. Um, but, you now you head north on, I think it's Highway 41. I didn't write this one down. But I stopped in the town of Velva. And by the way, I, I should mention Turtle Lake has 581 people as of the 2010 census. And I'm going to give population figures for several of these towns. So, uh... You know, just to put it in perspective. Uh, so my next stop, mainly to get lunch, was in Velva, North Dakota. And Velva's a town of 1,084 people. It's actually a really great town, as you can see from this main street. Um, it's a really great town, and it's close to the city of Minot. You know, about, what, 20 minutes away from the city of Minot? So if you want small town living with the small town amenities, but you want big city amenities nearby... Velva might be your thing. And it has a very nice um, school, too. I'll just say that, even though I didn't film it. Um, I went through Granville, which I didn't write anything down about it. I didn't really drive around it, because uh, I don't care about it. <laughs> um, so I don't have any footage. And then I headed north. On my way north, I took a detour to the city of Upham. Now, Upham is a city of 130 people. There's a reason I took a detour to Upham. Uh, there's a school there, very old school, built in like 1904 or something, that actually inspired my interest in small schools and uh, photographing them and inspired my uh, interest in school closings. So Upham actually closed during my uh, first three years of teaching uh, but it has a beautiful beautiful school uh, which by the way was for sale for a while um, i have a link to its sales page but uh, it's apparently off the market which i don't know if that means it's been sold or if it means that the owner just gave up on trying to sell it but um, so if you have a use for this cool old building in a town of 130 people there you go um, but you know, one of the things that came up with that was, you know, what does happen when you close a school? Cause it is kind of the death knell for a small town to close their school. Um, I continued North. I sailed past the city of Newburgh. I don't know why I didn't stop and drive around that because that Newburgh and, and, uh, the town where I first taught actually share a lot, but I just kept going probably cause I was behind on my schedule. So I stopped in West Hope, a town of 429 people, which is also the town in North Dakota that's decided to take a risk on a guy from Pennsylvania as their science teacher. So this is a town where I got my first job. Um, I noticed many changes to the school. Um, you know, the glass bricks and old wooden windows were gone. Um, I, I noticed uh, a lot of additions to it and I did, I did some visiting because uh, I tried to see a former student there who'd started a business on Main Street, but uh, he was out of town. Ironically, when I got home, I found a post-it on my door. He apparently had come here at the time I was in West Hope and tried to visit me. And, of course, I was in West Hope, so uh, he left me a post-it on the door that, hey, I'll catch you next time. And so... Wow, that is cool, because I taught him like 20 years ago. You can't see me, but I need a drink of water there. Um, West Hope is about six miles south of the border. And of course, he wasn't there, but I had some other people I wanted to visit. So I did some visiting and of course drove around town and photographed a few things. Um, had to photograph the, the school again. Um, you know, I'll just say this. I want to do a video about each of these towns where I lived. I'll say this about West Hope. 
that was my first experience truly on my own, not in college, truly on my own, supporting myself and all that. And I definitely discovered how much I needed to grow up. And I learned a lot about myself in those three years there. So that was a really good experience for me. I think I did need to leave West Hope, though. I, I needed to get out on my own and rediscover and forge new paths and everything. So I'm glad I didn't stay there. I think I grew more because I left, but I am so glad I spent time living in West Hope. And like, like I told uh, one of the people I visited with, you guys shouldn't have been so nice to me when I moved here because uh, I might not have stayed otherwise. Because when I moved to North Dakota, the whole idea was it's just going to be a temporary, well, let's try this thing out. And if it doesn't work, I'll go back east. And I wanted an adventure. I didn't want the typical, oh, let's go to the mountains of Colorado. Let's go to the Hawaii. Let's go to Alaska. I wanted something different. And uh, I've done Lois Lenski's Prairie School on this channel. I guess that's what put the idea of the Dakotas in my head. So. There you are. Wow, I'm thirsty. So I, I did spend the night in Botno, North Dakota, but I had to get a preview of the Turtle Mountains first. You know, that's a plateau that's about 2,000 feet high or more, uh, 600 meters. And it rises three to 400 feet or 900 to 100 meters above the surrounding area. Uh, it's a whole area of timber and lakes, and it includes the famous Lake Metagoshi. So I stayed in Botno that night, a town of uh, 2,211 people, which is really a wonderful small town. has lots of amenities, includes a community college, has a, a wonderful, wonderful main street. It was kind of like my city when I lived in West Hope. You know, if I didn't want to go all the way to Minot, I could go to Botno. Um, and it has a beautiful school. But then I headed back to the Turtle Mountains, which uh, Botno is, you know, just south of the Turtle Mountains. So you continue down Main Street and you're in the Turtle Mountains. Um, these were actually home to the Plains Ojibwe tribe. Um, there is a reservation that's further east that includes the Chippewa. I'm not going to focus on it this summer. But I definitely think it's worth looking at. I'll tell you about that toward the end of the video. What what came to my brain during this time. But it's a deciduous forest. Sorry, my dad's a forester, my brother's a forester, and I have a mother who loves plants, so I know this stuff. And it has some beautiful, fun salamanders. Uh, there's the Lake Metagoshi Recreational Area, which actually is surrounded by a lot of lake houses which are like second homes to people that they would go there every weekend so you know west hope would empty out on the weekends because people would all go who had who owned them would all go to their lake houses and there's me sitting in west hope saying well, i don't have money for a lake house i don't even have one house i just have a rental sorry need another sip there but anyway a beautiful area um I had planned to visit the International Peace Gardens, but I should have researched that before I left home. Uh, the International Peace Gardens straddle the uh, U.S.-Canadian border. And it is no trouble for people from either nation to get in. The trouble is getting out. On the U.S. side, well, let's not talk about the Canadian side. <laughs> On the U.S. side... You need a passport to get back into the country. But thanks to uh, our congressional, well, I shouldn't say our congressional delegation, but people protesting, the U.S. now allows people who just go in to visit the park. Uh, they can also just give a driver's license and birth certificate to, to return. I didn't bring my birth certificate and I don't have a passport. So my plan is I'm going to get a passport this summer and I'm planning to go back up there. I I mean, I'm a teacher. I've got summers off, so what the hell. Uh, but I'm going to go back up there and visit the International Peace Gardens. The other thing that made it pretty easy not to visit the Peace Gardens, it was 
pouring rain. At times I had my wipers on high. So even if I had gone to the peace gardens, it would not have been much fun. So I'll get my passport. I'll go back. So sadly, I had to continue south. Um, ended up in Dunseith, a town of 773, which is on the edge of the reservation which like i said i want to come back to that reservation and talk about it uh, but i think that'll be a research project for another summer uh, which i'll get to at the end of the video and then i went south from dunseith kind of in the reverse of my very first trip into north dakota um on highway three to the city of rugby which is a town of 2876 people it is, not quite, but sort of, the center of the North American continent. And there has been a bit of a fight with the city of Robinson, North Dakota, which you will not see on this trip, but uh, somehow I need to figure out how to work it into a video somewhere. Uh, because a bar there discovered that they had let their trademark on that lapse and bought the trademark. And say, so put a little sign kind of in the middle of the floor in their barn, this little nothing town uh, about being the nation's center. Or, sorry, the North America's center. But Rugby is a beautiful town, has a very nice main street, and has an Amtrak depot. Uh, but I had to get out. I, I, I'm a teacher. One of the reasons I teach is because I can't sit all day. I, I like the fact that as a teacher, I'm on my feet for my job all day. So anyway, I got some coffee there, which I didn't need a second cup of coffee and never drink a second cup of coffee, but I did. And uh, stretched my legs. Uh, I'm just not a somebody who's going to sit in a car all day. Although I, most of this is driving footage, so apparently I did. Well, anyway, I headed south on Highway 3. Again, this part of highway three really struck me when i first moved to north dakota because of all the lakes and potholes that were along it when i say potholes i don't mean potholes in the road i mean prairie potholes which would be low spots that collect water and turn into wetlands so i headed south to meet a friend in harvey north dakota a town of 1783 people i taught in harvey for exactly one year now, I don't want to get into why. Um, I'll save that for my Harvey video, but uh, apparently the situation there has improved a lot. Harvey had and still has a very nice main street. Um, there is an amazing park around a dammed up Cheyenne River there. And by the way, if you have the degree, they are looking for a science teacher. In fact, she offered me a job, but I had to decline. <laughs> signed my contract here sorry um and truthfully when i first moved here i used to have nightmares and i'm not joking about this i used to have nightmares that i'd gone back to harvey and it was like why i'm so stupid i hate it here and so i feel like that's a sign from my subconscious that don't go back to harvey um uh, a good, an interesting central feature of Harvey is there is a switching yard in the middle of town. I used to wake, be woken up at night by the crashing, excuse me, as trains were built. You know, I am a huge fan of rail, but when you're woken up in the middle of the night by bang, 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 down the line of a whole bunch of train cars, eh, that gets kind of old after a once um i headed south on highway three to herdsfield a town of 84 uh, when i lived there there was still an elementary school there it, it is now closed a uh, very neat old school and when i was there which is part of why i didn't really show it much there were people taking stuff out of the school so i feel like either it's in the process of being torn down or maybe somebody has a new purpose for it. I'm not sure which, and I couldn't find out. So I headed west on Highway 200 to Goodrich, which is a cute... Can I call a town cute? I'm going to call it Goodrich cute. It's a cute town of 98 people. Uh, the high school recently closed. Uh, they still have an elementary for now, not 
much of an elementary, but they have one. I was a little disappointed that most of Main Street has been torn down. I used to eat at the Harvester restaurant there, and uh, they used to have a grocery store there. Uh, I, I remember, this must be 15 years ago, I stopped there one day while I was moving to Harvey. And uh, I got invited to their 4th of July community picnic. And, you know, I met a whole bunch of people I'd never met before and will never see again. But what a fun bunch of people. I mean, they probably don't share my politics, but what a, what a great group of people. So I, I just really enjoyed Harvey. Oh, sorry, sorry. I did not really enjoy Harvey. I take that part back. I really enjoyed Goodrich. Just what a cool little town. And then I continued west to the town of McCluskey, which involved me backtracking about nine miles to get back to where I wanted to be. That's a town of about 380 people. Uh, if I'd continued on Highway 200, I would have ended up in Turtle Lake, but uh, you know I didn't want to go back to Turtle Lake, so yeah. But anyway, uh, McCluskey is the heart of Sheridan County, and in fact... The park in McCluskey has a heart made out of girders. Uh, it's almost, you got to go five miles south to get to the actual place, but there's nothing there. It's almost the geographical center of North Dakota. They have a small school. The high school is an old, early 1900s building um, with wooden floors, transom windows, lots and lots of stairs, of course. Uh, there's a gym addition, and then the gym connects to the new addition, newest addition, which has the offices, the science room, and the computer lab. So it's kind of like a ship with uh, high high end high things at both end, and then the you know the gym is the low spot in the middle. Uh, I love McCluskey too. In fact, um, same year as my whole experience in Goodrich, uh, while I was considering Harvey, I came back home from Harvey, because I'd just gone to drive around and walk around Harvey, uh, my way was blocked by a diesel spill on the highway. So I'm like, well, what do I do? You know, I knew I could go out on the gravel, find a gravel road that goes north, go west, and then come south and get around it. But I thought, well, why don't I drive around town? While driving around town, I saw that there was a concert with food going on at the elementary. Now, I was hungry. I'd been planning to cook when I got home to Turtle Lake, but hey, food. <laughs> so I stopped at the elementary and went in. I ended up spending the evening with some very, with this, you know, just really, really welcoming group of uh, farmers and ranchers. And, you know, they're just friendly. We talked about lots of stuff. And, uh, yeah, just a great time. So I have had a soft spot for McCluskey ever since then. Uh, so again, I had to backtrack to Highway 14. And then I went south to Wing, North Dakota, a town of 152. This is a cool little town in Burley County, which is the same county as Bismarck. And still has a high school, has a good science extracurriculars like a science olympiad which i coach robotics and a couple of other things and by the way they do need a new science teacher so i'll just put that out there oh uh, why aren't you going there um well let's talk about that later has a very limited but cool main street um just just a very nice little town in the middle of nowhere I don't know what people who live in Wing do for a living, but I could say that about a lot of small towns. As I left Wing, I realized that's well, actually pretty early. You know, I thought, well, I'll spend the night in uh, a motel. But, you know, keep in mind, I'd planned to spend my morning in the Peace Gardens, and that didn't happen. So I, I had shaved a good two, three, maybe four hours off of my day. And even though it made for a long day, I did decide to go back to Bowman. I stopped briefly in Dickinson to pick up groceries, but we don't need to see a picture of that. And then, uh, you know, it was a long two days of driving. 
but I'm glad I did it. I got to see some old friends. I got to be surprised by seeing some other friends I didn't expect to see. And on this trip, one of the ideas that came to me as I was heading south toward my town was I should do each summer. You know, I'm going to do the Great Sioux War Project this summer. I've already started working on that. But each summer, I need to tell the story of each reservation. So I think next summer, I'm going to tell the story of the Fort Totten Reservation because I spent time working there. And hopefully you'll see some video footage from there soon. But I want to tell the story of the other reservations too. So that is my set of summer projects for the next few years. So we'll see what happens with that, but that is my plan. So anyway, if you made it this far, I want to thank you for watching. And if videos like this interest you where I talk about fountain pens and inks, uh, both new and old, and at all price points, or other random topics, because apparently I do that too, I would invite you to subscribe. And hey, have you ever been to North Dakota? Would you like to visit North Dakota? Let us know down in the comments. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.